Welcome back to Allison Customs Project Car TV. Today I have a different kind of video for you in that I don't usually try and sh teach you how to weld. And on this video I'm not trying to I'm not trying to teach you how to weld either. Um, however, my father-in-law who has been a welder since uh, I think we learned in the video like 42 or something. Um, he he's comes over and is teaching me how to braze. So for those of you who have ever welded with a gas torch, uh, my grandfather taught me how to weld oh, 40 years ago or thereabouts with a gas torch and a coat hanger for filler rod and you learned how to control the puddle. For those of you learning the TIG weld, if you want a less expensive way to learn the coordination that goes involved, get a torch and get a coat hanger, some filler rod, and just learn to lay down a bead. And learning that process will make you a better TIG welder because it's very, very similar in the process. All that said, what comes about is I have this old forklift. As many of you have seen some of the old videos on it where I did brakes or uh, went through the engine, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, the bottom of the main cradle that, that has the forks on it is cast iron and it was cracked probably has been for 20 years who knows 40 years the thing is a 1952 or a 54 model while i had this whole thing apart one of the things he and i talked about was repairing that cast iron and the the forks have actually sat out here for over a year the forklift has it the forklift truck runs but it wasn't a forklift because all the forks and everything were off of it so he finally just decided one day that he was coming over and he was gonna help me fix it. And, uh, you know, cause he, he'd ask me, hey, what do you wanna mess with that? Now, any time, and then I would never follow through. It was, it was my own fault. Well, he, he got fed up with waiting on me, so he decided we were doing it, and we did this last Tuesday. So, in that process, I'm learning how to braise, which I've never done before. I've seen a few YouTube videos on it. Never really got a good explanation of what the goal was, I mean, other than you're putting a different metal in, and I wasn't sure how strong all that would be. And, and we didn't really get into the tensile strengths of the rod we were using or of the cast iron, because a, a, there's no way to know what the tensile strength of the cast iron is anymore. It's not like we can call the manufacturer and say, hey, what is this? And then, so we guessed on a, on a good rod for it, but he teaches us and I say us because I filmed as much of it as I could, um, what to look for and what we're doing. And, and unfortunately for us, it's a windy day. It's pretty chilly outside. And I happen to own a very small torch, not like a jeweler's torch or anything. I mean, but it, it's, it's not as big a torch as he would normally use in, in his experience. So it takes us a while. The video is fairly long because of that. And I didn't cut any of it out, mostly because once I get him talking and telling us about what's going on with the weld puddle he's working on, it jumps over and we start getting stories about Korea and we get stories about, uh, I think we get a story about him growing up on a farm in Kansas. And it, he, he's gonna be 90 years old in August. Uh, August 2020 would be 90 years old. So, you know, we, we just, he has a world of knowledge and, and a wealth of, I guess a wealth of knowledge and a world of experience. And so I, I tried to get some of that out of him in the video. So we're gonna learn to braise today, or braise cast iron. And we're also gonna get some really cool stories. So I hope you enjoy the video. That's what it's about. You'll hear me talking at the very beginning when he's trying to grind. Basically, I was trying to tell you a little bit of what I've just told you. Just kind of ignore it, move on. Um, once we get past making the big V wedge that we're gonna fill back in with brass, you can hear all, you know, all of the conversation and I've done the best I can to make sure the, the conversation comes out in the audio. I apologize because it does get a little jumpy because I'm filming it all with my iPhone because it was kind of a last minute, hey, we should film this, you know, and try and catch some of what it's going so you'll see that we i start the video while he's already grinding but it's just grinding I and mean, it's just making a big v 
in there so that we can get that brass all the way down into the bottom of the cut. So we're filling the whole thing. And this cast iron is thick. It's heavy, it's thick. It takes quite a while to heat it. So I do, while we're just trying to heat that up, I do fast forward through a lot of that. Um, I don't cut any of it out. I, I just fast forwarded through it. And then anytime we started to talk, I cut back to real time. So hope you enjoy. We'll see you again next week. This is my father-in-law finding out the cast iron. He's going to teach me how to braise up that cast iron crack that's in the bottom of this fork tower for my forklift. I'm starting to... I need to get it a little further in here. It's always get a wedge in there for it. Just, just a little bit left in, of the original material on the bottom. I can get just a little bit more back in there. You'll have it? Be all right. Oh yeah, because there's that rib in there. There's a, uh, that, that ring, ring the yeah. ring comes clear up there too. Okay, now, uh, this a little harder to get to, a little more of it. So my father-in-law here is 89, be 90 a couple months, and I've been wanting to get this project done for a long time, but uh, just just been lazy on my part. And so the other day he said, "Let's just get it done." And I needed to get it done before he wasn't able to weld anymore, so I need to learn. So I'll bring you back when we're done grinding and uh, see what we get. Got a chair if you want it. <laughs> a torch is little. <laughs> yeah. You see where it's turning? Can you see the... The orange in there? When it turns, starts turning red, then the metal, uh -huh. that's the thinnest place. It, okay. heats, it heats quicker than where I'm on right now. So we got to try to get them where they're both the same color. So now you just heated that rod up just a little bit and then dipped it in that flux? Yeah. Okay. Oh yeah, all it takes is just a little bit of heat to stick. If you put too much heat, you'll melt your brass. And... See, when it's hot enough, the metal, uh huh. You see that brass stick to it there where it melted. Yes, I do see that. Now see, this side here is not quite hot enough yet. Oh, because it's still balling up rather than yeah. sticking. Okay. When it's hot enough, it'll, it'll just kind of. That ball will kind of lay down and just be smooth. You know? Okay. There it goes. It's starting to lay out, huh? Yeah. See, it's sticking on this other side. Yeah, on that top side. See? Yeah, it's... Now it's starting to stick on the lay on this side. I can just see it starting to. I'm recording you, so <laughs> A, I can learn. <laughs> but tell us about the, the can of flux you have. Okay, uh, 
different, different. Uh, I guess the correct word is there's, there's different kinds of brass. There's white and there's yellow and there's and they each take a special uh, uh, flux. And so just to make it easier, when you don't know what the base metal is exactly, if you get a can of uh, you get seven, the different fluxes they have, there's about three of them, just mix them all together, the, the one that is meant for that particular base metal will work. The other will just melt off. Okay. Burn up. So you don't have to constantly worry about which one to use. You just, just, just have a can with all of them in it and yeah, the, sure. whatever you don't need will burn away. That's right. Well, it's balled up there. I gotta heat the the base of this again. Well, between my little torch and the wind, I'm sure I wasn't helping our. <laughs> the well, wind's not helping the our wind process. Ain't helping <laughs> any is the cold wind. And, so we're gonna get it. You see how? It, you there? You see the brass? Yep. Just start to to flow yeah, out. You see, all of a sudden it just drops. You know. That the ball that melt that chunk was there uh, wasn't melted. Right. When the base metal gets hot enough that it melts this brass, why then? It, and with the the uh, flux that you got on it, it just it just flows. What we call flow, it flows right onto the metal. Now see this. Yeah. It's starting to get that way right now. Yeah, you see it turn down. You yeah. see it turn shiny. Uh huh. Oh yeah. So is that little pin hole that's in there, is that yeah. is from not enough heat, or is it? If, uh, yeah, it's not enough heat, and there's some some little old thing of, of preventing it from flowing together. Okay. So you just keep the heat on it, and then feed it back. Feed back into it. Yeah. See, there's another little hole right here, too. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. I'll try to get this other side over here. Get get a layer on it, and then you mm -hmm. you put the, your brass will flow together. But Can you see it going in there now? Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, that's the, that's the trick, man. If you keep flux on it, because you never know. It's all right to use more flux than is really necessary, but it keeps you 
from fighting a bad, a little rusty or a little dirty spot that's okay. on the base metal. Like I said, that little torch can't be helping. Well, it'd go. We could do it a lot quicker. We had a. So when did you start welding, Ken? In uh, 1948. You were uh, you were 18 years old. Yeah. Or was that when you were in the Marines? No, it was right after. Uh, it was it's actually before, just before I went in the Marines. Then I went, uh, when I got back from the Marines, I got, went back to a, you know, uh, started in a machine shop. And when, where was that when you were in the in, machine shop? Uh, uh, there was a, a big machine shop in Lyons, Kansas. And my dad had a cousin there worked in the, for one of the big oil companies. Uh -huh. And he got me a job in the oil field and, and the company the they the oil company had a lot of their own production. And, parts of Kansas and clear down into Oklahoma and there was a big drilling program started down there all along the uh, Kansas Oklahoma border and a lot of those wells were uh, they flowed that means they didn't have to have a pump jack on it. Yeah. Oh, okay. And but it didn't last long. So in order to keep producing the well, they had to put a pump jack on it. You know what that is? Yeah. The thing you set up and you see off at a distance going up and down. Yep. Yeah. Sawhorse. Yep. And We're going to eventually get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put a little more heat back up here this way. And uh, what I had to do is build a, a skid out of four and a half inch drill pipe, which is real thick, <laughs> you know. It, the, the ball thickness is real thick. And yeah. <laughs> then the, you build a, a base to set the engine on, a big old 503 Fair, Fairbanks engine. The little old kind that goes boom, 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 pop, boom, 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 boom. <laughs> They're just a big old single. Oh, a giant single cylinder thing, you know. Yeah. Some of those wells were deep, and 
you know, there's a lot of weight coming in on the, the, with the sucker rod that operated the pump that's down there. It's just an up and down motion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, you built the uh, built this skid and then you set the the pump jack on it. It came in already, you know, on a frame. You set that on the skid you built, welded it down, and then you build a base to set that big old is a Fairbanks engine is a 503. That was the size of it, pretty good size. Yeah. That's where I got most of my welding experience is building those skids. So. And you did that from, from when you got back from Korea. Yeah. So when? And then, so was that like you got back in 52? Yeah, it was 53 actually. Was My time in Korea was 52 and 3. Okay. It started in 51, late 51. Uh -huh. And I wasn't there at the start, but it was in the beginning. Okay. And I didn't do any well in there. I was at Aviation Ordnance. You know what ordnance is. Oh yeah, the bombs and all bombs. that. Well, they crammed a lot of the schools. Ordnance school. How to mix napalm. The rest is just mechanical. The bombs, when they're shipped in, they're in a crate. But they... Uh, they don't have a pin on them. You can take them out of the crate and put that pin on it. You know what the pin looks mm -hmm. like on the back of the bomb. Yeah. And so that was what we did in the in-between flights and stuff. Is keep those pins, keep pins on them, pins on the five-inch rockets. The rocket, a uh, five-inch rocket's about five, six feet long. It had a small fin that went on the back end. Yeah, you had both all them in place. So, you know, we what we did was, I was in charge of the ordinance group. A staff NCO, not an officer, but, uh, so when, we didn't have nothing to do. Well, that's what we were doing, was putting pins on the bombs and the rockets, the five-inch rockets. And napalm, you couldn't mix it and save it. You had, whenever we got an order, a uh, frack, they called it a frack order, what the planes were going to carry. Yeah. When it was going to, the flight was going to carry napalm, we mixed it right then. Oh, wow. The napalm is nothing but a powder. You've seen Portland cement in a sack. and sure. you know, sure. That kind of a greeny yep. look. That's the way napalm looks. It's like, just like that Portland cement. And, and it took, uh, the right amount of high octane jet fuel and where it, uh, the nickname for napalm was the jelly bomb and the perfect mix of napalm was where it was like jelly like uh, loose Jello? No. You know how Mick, before it sets up, yeah, yeah. 
Well, you know what a gummy bear is? Sure. You know how hard they are? Uh-huh. Okay, that wouldn't work in an napalm ball. Okay. It was, that was, you had to have a thick, loose, loose jello, you know. And so you squirted it out there on the ground and you picked up the napalm with, they had a, a they called it a cherry picker, just a side boom on a little dozer. Yeah. We picked it up with that with a, with a swing. And then we had a, a, the jet fuel is in a tank on a trailer. And you run the two together and you run it into this tank in the, in the they call it a bomb, but it was a fuel tank. The fuel tanks off the of F9F Panther jet, the Navy and Spider plane. Uh-huh. 950 gallons. And you run that in that tank, you know, together. Well, what made it what made it a bomb, they converted these fuel tanks. All it was is where the lid was, where you took it off to put the jet fuel in. They took it, they changed that out. And uh, the fuse that you put in it, it, it screwed in that place that where it was the cap, that one originally. I'm sort of sticking up to that one side. But, uh, <laughs> where I'd squirt that out there on the ground to get it the right mixture going together. Uh-huh. Why, it'd be like that, uh, you know, a six, eight foot long gummy, gummy bear. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like rubber, you know. And... We had those little old wood burning, uh, not wood burning, but little fuel oil heaters in our the in our tents. You pick up that gummy worm and burn it in your tent. And <laughs> a lot of times we'd run out of fuel oil, and we would bring it in from Japan on a. LSD, it was a, like a freighter. Uh huh. And they would, uh, a lot of times they would have a lot of bad weather and they couldn't get in to our, that port where we they had, a, had the bay air trip. Anyway, I would take a, just a little piece of it. You know, half the size of your palm and put in that little stove and light it and it would burn, you know. But yeah, you, you, had, you had to be careful. You didn't want too much. It would melt that damn stove down. <laughs> burn the tent. <laughs> You'd be homeless. Yeah. <laughs> well, this idiot from the parachute law, he said, Why are you guys, how come you guys got heat in here? Well, there's five of us in a tent. And one of the guys said, Oh, oh, Sarge over there, he put some that mixed napalm, you know. in there and that's where we're getting heat we don't have fuel just like you your, your tent you guys don't have 
Well, that idiot, we didn't know it. That idiot went down the hole and had that head hey, laying around you. Know. <laughs> he gets a, I don't know how much, big blob of it. Put it in his stove. No, oh, it, what it melted was the little, uh, like a little three inch stove pipe, you know, went out the top and see it. Uh huh. Well, so the story we get is it got that thing red hot and then it collapsed and caught the tent on fire. Well, when they questioned this guy, so well, Sergeant Triplinson was burning napalm, you know, in his stove. And I did the same thing. Well, <laughs> then I get called. <laughs> so, we had to quit doing that. <laughs> you had to quit getting caught. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was me. You don't tell nobody else, you know? <laughs> what is this? So then when you came back from Korea, yeah. so that would have been 53. Yeah. And you were welding out there in Lyons. How long were you in Lyons before you came to New Mexico? We, we moved here in 68. 68. Okay. Yeah. So you were out there 15 years. Yeah, I, I'd learned welding pretty well by then. And so I come out here and that was the first thing I'd done was to find a welding job. And, and there was a big old shop out on West Main called Hicks Welding and Machine Shop. And he hired me. The guy that owned it. And I worked there two or three years. Then somebody gives me the idea of putting a rig, welding rig together and getting on my own. And that's what I did. We just backed up this side. Huh? Well, yeah, the wee part where I sit here and watch how you <laughs> watch <laughs> <the> work. <laughs> well, this ain't the easiest thing. This, you know, a bigger torch would have been even better, but this is just slower. You know, it gets just as hot. Right, it just the lot of it is the bigger one keeps it hotter, keep, keeps the heat in keeps there longer, the heat in you're, where you're you spreading want it. it around more. Well, at least, and this is the bigger side, so the other one should go a little easier in. Anyway. Yeah, it's going to be better, and we got a lot of this heat's transferred. It's sure. hot over here, too. Yeah, I wouldn't want to touch it right now. No, no. <laughs> Now, and you once you got on your own you welded pipeline you welded oil you did all kinds of oil field that was most yeah. of your your business right it was oil field yeah it was uh i've done an awful lot of work for companies like Dowell. you know they had a lot of chemicals and, and acid and you know, the tanks and the trailers and uh, and we get holes in them, I patch the leaks, and, and then just because they like what I did, I done a lot of stuff in the building, build racks and shelves. And yeah, I remember many, many years ago, I remember you working, I don't know where you were working at, but you were building somebody 
handrails and ladders and or maybe maybe steps and handrails on those. Well, was, and, I did a lot of that in Motif. Okay. That, there's a big one goes all the way. Well, see, when the government come in and, and cost a lot of extra money for people, you know, and, well, they just had a two before handmade ladder nailed on the side of their of the shop, the interior of their shop. Put a little bit more here, and then I'm going to rest my hands okay. before I start the other side. Oh, guys, you know the best best job I ever had. I made, well, for making money was when I worked for uh, this contractor out of Marshfield, Missouri. It's called Pipe Fabricators. What do you think? I think it's pretty good for somebody <laughs> who claims they can't see and they're shaky. <laughs> Yo! Because I'm going I'm to let you make, I'm going to try this side. Yeah. So you can. All right, guys, we'll. It's cold out here, and so uh, Ken decided he was headed home as soon as we got done. And I wanted to show you what the finished product looked like. You can see, so this is the one that he was raising up and showing me how to do it. And of course, he had the most effort because not only was his side longer, it's also thicker, and uh, it, because of that, he was he ended up putting most of the heat in this whole thing. And then uh, I struggled over on this side, trying to build up this side enough. And he, he kept calling it, you had to build a bridge or build a, a shelf. And I finally understood what he was trying to teach me. Um, so when I got over here, it went a little better. The inside, you know, the, you can still see where the crack was, but it's all filled in now. And... Uh, Anyway, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have anyway, I'm gonna take a wire brush and clean that up a little bit more and then all this will get painted and we'll slide this cylinder back in there and then this hole in the cylinder lines up with the hole that we left and that's where the fitting for the uh, hydraulic line goes. So uh, I'm gonna go warm up a little bit and then we'll get back out here and get this done. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the stories. It's always good to get him to start talking because you get a, a really good story and he'll jump from one subject to the other like we we went from Weldon to Korea and back but um, I think everybody should enjoy that.